here for the countdown. Good morning, church. We are so glad that you gathered with us um, for worship this morning. The main big thing that we, I want you guys to look at on your bulletin at the bottom is a um, nomination list for our university and discipleship minister. So if you could tear that off at right now at the end of the service and fill that out, we, would, we have baskets outside the doors and then the offering boxes in the back that we'd love you to drop those in um, because that's a significant aspect of being a church member um, is having a voice and, um, and seeking God's counsel on who the leadership is uh, for our body. And so we would love for you to participate in that way with us. But other than that, we um, are done with our normal schedule of the gathering. Um, we, we ended uh, a great semester with Oakley Winter. She came and did an incredible job. If you haven't listened to that, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube. You should check it out. Um, but now it, it kickstarts the end of school and the summer event. So I, I actually get to take our 10 seniors um, on, a, on a trip to Angel Fire today. So if you'll be in prayer for those students and us as we travel and also our long list of activities this summer, we would greatly appreciate it. But if you guys will stand with me, um, I'll pray and we can start to worship. God, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to, um, to sing your praises, to give you thanks, to celebrate all that you have done um, in our everyday, even amidst the chaos, amidst the hustle and bustle of graduation season and the end of school and sports starting back up, that Lord, that we don't miss you, that we see you in everything and we bring you into everything. So Lord, today let us sing your praises. Let us worship you with all that we do. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Are you washed in the blood? There is, uh, there is nothing other than the blood of the lamb that can make us spotless and white as snow. So this morning we're going to begin with, are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Sing it out. Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Stories of what they think 
stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, you are waking. separated the oceans. You are he who made the way. Father, uh, we just come before you just just thanking you for that and, and that you do keep your promises and that uh, uh, that you will come again, Father. You will come again and and, uh, and Lord, just be with Earl as he brings a message this morning. I'm just, we love you and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to tell you about a mentor that I had when I was a teenager. It was our pastor's wife, and her name was Janet Burton. Um, uh, we had a new pastor that came either when I was a, a preteen or just a young teen. And uh, uh, they were just a fantastic couple. We all liked them. But his wife began to see that we didn't have a youth minister. And uh, so she decided that she would serve as the youth minister. And so she um, got us all together and she had Bible studies for us and she made sure we had fellowships. <clears throat> and we saw her uh, serve others and be kind. She taught us with her life. She taught us to be kind and to serve others. And she encouraged us to work in Bible school every year so that we would learn to teach also. And she um, encouraged us to do things for others. Um, she was just a good person, a good mentor, that I looked up to even after they left the church. They were there all, the, all during the time I was a teenager. Um, but we kept in touch all these years. And she gave us nuggets of truth and anytime we had a problem, we could go to her and we could discuss it and she would give her advice. We also um, gave her um, our love and devotion and she showed us how to serve others she made sure we had mission trips and different things that we could do to serve others and she that with the nuggets of truth that she gave us i hope to pass on to these uh, kids that i teach on wednesday night every wednesday night i teach in the team kid area and I just hope I just try to uh, show them the nuggets of truth from the Bible and how we all need to believe in the Bible I'd like to this is the sixth in a series of seven sermons I titled mentoring in our method of operation we 
I, I've recruited uh, one of the people that actually did one of these testimonies. They said, I must love you a lot because I don't do this. Uh, I won't tell who it was. But so this is a major step for everyone who shared, done a great job with that. And each week we've looked at people talking about how they didn't get where they are in life by themselves, but that there were other people God included in their lives to help them as they moved along. And then we use an example out of the Bible uh, of some um, of the mentoring relationship that takes place. And my goal is that by the end of this, we have one more Sunday, but after, at the end of this, that we will see relationships as places where we need to be intentional on giving wise counsel and encouragement and receiving wise counsel and encouragement, that there's a whole lot more to the relationships that you have with other people that you need to make with other people than just the things of this world, uh, but that we really, we desperately need one another and we need to be involved in the lives of other people and let them be involved in our lives as well. Uh, this morning our passage is in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. Uh, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had gone on what we call the first missionary trip. They'd gone through what is come today Turkey. Uh, they had seen people come to know the Lord, and they were baptized. They established some churches. Then they came back to Antioch, which was their sending church, a home base. Uh, they, they stayed there for, it doesn't tell us how long, but for an extended period of time. They'd had a celebration. They were glad to be there. And then... Uh, the Apostle Paul, he got that itch. He's just like, oh, we need to go back. Uh, we've got to go back and check on them. He did not see, and just I hope you don't see this either. He didn't see the end being if somebody gets baptized and then they uh, have their security as far as going to heaven, then the job's over. He didn't see that. Is that, yes, we've, we've seen people come to the Lord, we've baptized them, we've established churches, put people in leadership, but we need to go back and we need to make sure that they're doing okay. We need to continue to invest ourselves in them. And that's the same way we need to be with other people. You're not wasting your time if you're spending time with people who are already Christians and encouraging them as they go through life and help them to, to grow. And so he says to Barnabas, uh, let's go back and see how things are going. And then that's where the following events unfold. It says, and after some days, uh, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. God used Barnabas to save John Mark from uselessness. God still can use us to help others who fail at some point in life. And from this particular passage, that it, it was an event that occurred relatively early in the history of the church... Uh, there are three really simple, yet I think very significant truths that stand out that we can apply to our lives and our church. First of all, God allows us to, to fail. Secondly, God expects us to repent. And finally, God encourages us to continue. First of all, God allows us to fail. Uh, by that I mean, I'm not saying God makes us do that. I'm just saying that the way the whole world is set up that the world is set up, that this is a fallen world, temptation is a reality, uh, no matter how good you are, no matter how, how far you get along in life, uh, there are always opportunities uh, to fail. And uh, God allows us to fail. He could, he could have programmed us and made us where we never sinned, where we never did anything wrong, uh, but he's allowed the reality of failure to happen. God allows us to fail while serving him. So what we have here with John Mark is not someone who's never known Christ or never served Christ, but John Mark knew the Lord. Uh, he is a distant relative to Barnabas, and on the first missionary trip, Paul and Barnabas took John Mark along with them to do some task and to help them along the way. Plenty of things to do. And then it says simply in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, that, that John Mark left and returned to Jerusalem. He just, he went. 
And so it was not while John Mark was out of the will of God, it was while he was actually young. He'd, he'd made a lot of sacrifices. He's a young man. He's left everything that was familiar. He's gone to go with Paul and Barnabas. He's, he's made a major sacrifice. He's, he's doing what God wants him to do. And while he's in the midst of doing what God wants him to do, uh, he deserts his post. He, he leaves. He quits. He, he goes back home. And so while he was serving the Lord... All of us know, and probably all of us have done it, that even after we were saved, while we were serving the Lord, while we're trying to do what He wants us to do, in the midst of that, uh, we have failed, we have sinned. It says actually in John chapter 1, that in, uh, or 1 John 1, it says if we say we have not sinned, we are liars and the truth is not in us. So the reality is, God allows us to fail, and by us I mean believers. He, he allows us to fail while serving him in various, in various ways. Uh, we don't know exactly why John Mark returned to Jerusalem. I've heard some people wrote, said maybe he had a girlfriend back there and he wanted to go and check in and got to missing her. Maybe he missed his mama's home cooking. I doubt that Barnabas and Paul were very good cooks. Uh, or it could have been there's a change of leadership here. This is about the time where you have Paul always mentioned first, he's taking the lead and Barnabas is stepping back. And, you know, kind of like sometimes in the church when the preacher changes, some people don't like that and they, they, they don't want to continue to continue on. So maybe there's a different leader and he, we, we really don't know. Uh, the same way in our lives, uh, God allows us to fail uh, in various ways. I think most of us have what I call the Achilles heel of our uh, spiritual development. There are certain things that are more tempting to us than they are to others. We, and, and Satan is not omniscient in the sense that he, he can't know everything, but he's watching. He, uh, he knows, and when we repeatedly fail in the same way, he knows how to get to us. He knows, he knows what it is that's going to bother us. And so that's why you need to be careful in being judgmental of other people that struggle in ways that you've never even been tempted. It's like, why would anybody ever do that? I don't have it. I don't never bother me at all. Well, well, that's good, but you may struggle and you will struggle in some area. So in various ways, God allows us to fail even after we're saved while we're serving the Lord, uh, causing negative consequences. None of us sin or fail to ourselves. Um, it affects us, but there are negative consequences that affect a lot of people around us. When John Mark decided to return to Jerusalem in that first missionary journey, it wasn't just that his life kind of goes on hold for a while and takes a different path than what it should have. Because we see here that Barnabas and Paul have such a sharp disagreement about John Mark later on that they part ways and they go different places. That John Mark's decision didn't just affect John Mark. John Mark's decision affected Barnabas and it affected Paul. It, you know, if, if it wouldn't have been for John Mark doing that, the dream team of missionaries may have continued on for a decade or two more. Who, who knows? But, but his actions affected others. Uh, I don't get to do it very often in western Oklahoma, but if I ever catch a pond that's glassy smooth, I don't know, it's just kind of in me. I just want to mess it up. So... I like to take a rock and throw it out there and watch it hit. And the only thing better than that is skipping a rock across a, a smooth pond. Did you ever notice when you do that, that there are those ripples, that when the, where the rock goes in, there's a ring here, and then there's a ring here, and there's a ring here, and there's a ring here, and there's a ring here. That's like our failures. That's like our sin. But yes, it, it affects us. But it affects those we love. It affects those friends we have. It affects the church we're a part of. It affects, there's just a wide... It causes, uh, very, it causes negative consequences. I've been present when I've seen people say basically, I'm just hurting myself. Leave me alone. It's my choice. It's my life. It's my whatever. It's a very selfish statement. But the reality is that None of us sins to himself or herself that the actions we take affect a lot of other people. And I think that should even be one of the deterrents on the actions that we take is that it hurts those that we love.
God allows us to fail. Secondly, God expects us to repent. Uh, repentance is, is in the fabric of Christianity. It's just a part of what happens. Uh, repentance means to a change of mind that leads to a change of action. It means to turn around. Uh, that's a reality when we are saved, that we change our minds about what we think about God and what we think about sin, and we change our way of thinking that leads to a change of way of action, and that's how we are born again. We are born again when we admit we have sinned, that we accept God's grace, and that He changes us from the inside out. That's salvation. But that's also every day of our lives, isn't it? Even after you're saved, that, that's, repentance is a part of what we do. That because we fall short and we don't measure it up, and then God's expectation in, in the light of that is that we would repent, that we would admit our sin, accept His grace, and change our behavior. And that's what He expected of John Mark here. First of all, as we repent, uh, you know, we admit our sins. You know, for, for Christian living, um, sin is the unnecessary inevitability. It, that, yeah, you impressed, Trevor? Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I'm sure I heard it somewhere else. I'm to the age now, I've got all this stuff in my head, I don't know where it came from, I just claim it all for my own. I don't quote anybody anymore. It's just all in there. Uh, the unnecessary inevitability. It's like, it doesn't have to happen. You don't have to do this, but it's inevitable it's going to happen before long. You're not going to get into a place in this world where you never sin again. So, God expects us to repent, admitting our sin. Admitting our sins. It says in 1 John 8, 1, 8, 9, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess our sins means that I say the same thing about it as God does. That I quit justifying my behavior. I quit denying my sin. I quit saying, yeah, I'm okay. I'm better than uh, somebody else. I, I don't compare my... I admit to God. And that confession, that admission is between me and God. It's not between you and me or you and somebody else. It's, just before, it's as simple as admitting to God uh, that I have sinned. Uh, it adds nothing to the completed work of Christ on the cross, but it restores fellowship between you and God. And so, and it could be as simple as, God, I realize that what I did was sinful, and it's one of the reasons Jesus had to die on the cross, and I'm sorry for what I've done. It's as simple as that. God expects us to repent, admitting our sins, accepting His grace. Now, we don't know when John Mark admitted his sin and accepted God's grace, but we know that he did that, or he wouldn't have been willing to go again on a missionary journey, and Barnabas would not have asked him to go again. Somewhere and in, in, we don't know what caused that to happen, what, how the Holy Spirit convicted him. Maybe when he heard Barnabas and Paul talking to the church at Antioch and he's listening to all these things that God had done, he missed out on that. He realizes he shouldn't have left. Uh, he shouldn't have uh, uh, done that. Maybe that convicted him. But somewhere along the way, he admitted his sin and then he accepted God's grace in the sense that God's grace is the undeserved favor of God that I realize that God has forgiven me, that God has accepted me. I don't have to go now for six weeks and try to work my way up into a better uh, way of doing things. Immediately, as I have confessed and admitted my sin, He has forgiven me, and I am restored to relationship with Him. I accept His grace. Uh, that's part of repentance is I accept that God's grace is such that He will forgive me based upon what Christ has done for me and not because of my own good works. And I have to accept that grace. John Mark had to accept that grace. He had to realize that God had forgiven him and therefore he could forgive himself. See, one of the things that hinders you from walking with God and doing what you need to do, you won't forgive yourself. You end up and you've done this and you've done that, and he's like, well, I, just, I, I, I don't want to say anything to, about it to God anymore. Like he don't know. I mean, we're going to keep it secret from him? He knows already, so let's, let's deal with it. So then you accept God's grace in the sense that God's grace is, is more than enough 
to grant forgiveness to me. And I don't want to abuse his grace. That doesn't make me want to just go out and sin so grace may abound, as Paul says in Romans. Uh, we don't want to do that. But you have to accept his grace. Part of repentance is I admit that I have sinned. I admit that I have, have done this. And I also accept the fact that God has forgiven me in Christ. And that I have to do that. And if you won't forgive yourself, if you won't accept God's grace, you can't move forward from that point. So God expects us to repent, admitting our sins, accepting His grace, changing our behavior. John Mark uh, goes with Barnabas to Cyprus. He goes, on, goes and beget, becomes a missionary and serves in various ways. Uh, there is no indication in the rest of the Acts or the rest of the New Testament that John Mark ever quit again. He actually goes on. He's the one who writes the second gospel. Matthew, Mark, that's John Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, he wrote that. He's a very close friend of Peter. It even comes to the, at Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy. He says, he tells Timothy, bring John Mark with you because he is profitable to me in ministry. And so there's a turnaround as far as what John Mark did. He didn't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. So part of repentance is that there is a change of behavior. Now, change behavior is not perfect behavior. Um, when I was young, I struggled a lot with temper. That even, I call that John Deere, or I call that 930 case, I wrote everything except a John Deere. Uh, I like that did, I mean, I'm ashamed of things I've done when I was younger, and I'm not, I'm not going to say I never get mad about anything again. Although it does tend to wear me out now. I just don't know that I have the energy for it. Uh, but I'm a changed man. If you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. She's been there with me the whole way. So she's seen that. Now that doesn't mean I never struggle with that again. It doesn't ever mean that I don't want to revert to my old ways. But by the grace of God, I'm, I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And I think there's a lot of you who could say the same thing about various things that you struggle with. Uh, that God is in the process of moving us forward and changing us. Not making us perfect, but changing us. And that's part of repentance is that I admit my sin. I accept God's grace. And by His grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, my behavior is changed. God allows us to fail. Uh, God expects us to repent. And God encourages us to continue. Uh, he wants us to continue on with our baggage. After we sin and after we do various things, that's always going to be a part of who we are. Now we're covered in the, we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. God doesn't hold it against us anymore. But there are scars that remain that are a part of who we are. Things we have done, things that have been done to us, things that are a part of life. Uh, like John Mark. When I hear of John Mark, usually the first thing I think about him is not I don't think, man, he wrote the second gospel. He's a, he was, he was uh, good buddies with Peter. You know what I usually think of? I, the first word that comes to my mind, I usually think quitter. I don't know why I think that. I just, that's just kind of how I've, I've pigeonholed him. And in your life, as you, even after you repent, even after God has forgiven you, after, as, as you continue on, he's not asking you to continue on. Uh, and after you get in pristine condition, it's with your baggage. You have these things that are, that are left over. But he still wants to use you. You remember when he told... Uh, Peter, he said, after you, he, he, he told him, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. But then when you have turned, when you've turned back around, strengthen your brothers. Let, let me use you. He didn't say, once you deny me three times, then you better get, hook it on back to the Sea of Galilee and see if you can get a job on a fishing boat because you're done with me, brother. I don't need people like you. You're going to, in my time of crisis, you're going to deny me three times. Hit the road. No, he said, when you've turned, strengthen your brothers. Did you know sometimes your weakest point makes you the most usable to God? That doesn't mean you go out there and try to see what you can do, that, you know, how you can fail and how you can sin. But I'm saying after it's all over with, all, after it's said and done, that scar, that baggage, that 
that reality makes you transparent, touchable, and helpful to all other people. Because you're not some person that everybody thinks, well, I could never measure up to that. You're real. You're, you're, you're genuine. Uh, my favorite preacher of all time, Ron Dunn, uh, one time he said, it would do some people some good if they'd just slip into some sin so they could empathize with some other people. I mean, it just slip into it. Uh, don't take that as me saying you need to go do that. Don't go look for you, you. I think we all slip in enough if we'd admit that. But rather than looking down our noses at everyone, there is an empathy with the reality we live in a fallen world and people are subject to temptation and, and they fail. And so God encourages us to continue with our baggage, even as we are, through those who encourage us. Now, this is where the mentoring part of this sermon comes in. Barnabas told Paul, he said, yeah, let's, let's go back, but let's take John Mark. And Paul said, I'm not taking him. He deserted his post. He quit. He didn't help us. I don't think it's wise. And Barnabas, and it wasn't because Barnabas was a distant relative. That wasn't it. Barnabas, you know, he was just naturally an encourager. You know people like that. Uh, they changed it. They nicknamed him Son of Encouragement. His, his given name was Simon, but they, Son of Encouragement. So he, he's wanting to give him a second chance. He's wanting to encourage him. He, wants, he feels like even though he really blew it, uh, there's enough of him left there to salvage, and I want to encourage him. And if it weren't for Barnabas, John Mark wouldn't have got back in the game. He wouldn't have been able to continue on. Barnabas is the one who said, come on, let's, let's do this. And if it means I have to break up with uh, Paul as far as our missionary journey, I, we, we'll go somewhere else. But there's enough of you left to salvage, and I want you to be able to, to get up. Real-life mentoring sometimes gets messy. Because people fail, people sin, people do all kinds of stuff. And part of mentoring is we come alongside and we encourage them to get up. We encourage them to go on. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I got my second uh, coronavirus shot. I got the shots. I had the virus. I had the shots. I'll shake your hand. I'm good to go, okay? So I, I debated about it. Anyway, I got the shot. Got it on Tuesday at noon, and I woke up Wednesday morning, and I felt like I had it again. I was achy. I was exhausted. I came into work, and I got at my I have stand-up desk. I was standing at it, and I'm making notes for Sunday morning. That's uh, I'm pretty well a machine as far as how I do life, if it, for what it's worth. I mean, I'm, I'm in, I even bore myself. Uh, so I'm making those notes, and I just, I, can't, I, I just can't stand there. I can't keep, I just can't stay focused. And about that time, Seth came in, and we're talking just a little, and I said, Seth, I'm, I, I'm just going to have to lay, I'm just going to rest for a second. And so I just laid in the floor. Well, evidently, I fell asleep. Because Allison came in a little bit, and I guess she saw me, and she didn't know whether to call 911 or uh, get up a pastor search committee. She didn't know uh, what, what had happened there. Uh, she goes and tells, tells Seth, and the next thing I know is I hear Seth saying, Earl, Earl, go home, go home. Well, well I didn't go home, but I did wake up, and I went back to work. I, I got up because he cared about me, and he, he did something. He, he helped me. He told me to get up. Part of mentoring is telling people, get up. You blew it. That, that, I don't, you're, join the human race. Get up. You disappointed yourself. You disappointed your parents. You disappointed your friends. You disappointed. That, that, get up. There's enough of you left to salvage. You're not useless. You're not done. Get up. That's part of mentoring is that you're there for people when maybe nobody else is. God encourages us to continue with our baggage through those who encourage us to get his work done. If God only used perfect people, there wouldn't be much that ever got done in the kingdom of God. John Mark failed. Peter failed. Every one of the apostles failed. I'd go as so far as to say every one of us believers in here this morning has failed 
since we trusted Christ as Savior. God uses people who have struggled and failed in various ways. I'm excited about the return of everybody to church. We're not where we were before the coronavirus hit, but we're making gains on it. And I realized several months ago that there may be some people who never come back. I, don't, I mean, I don't know why, but I mean, I'm, I'm, there's just been so many things that could have factored into that. But I'm absolutely certain that God can and will make this church stronger and better than it's ever been because of His power, not because of who we are. God's not looking for ability. God's looking for availability. And many of those who are most available have some baggage, have some scars. But that doesn't keep God from accomplishing His work. So, God allows us to fail. God expects us to repent. And then God encourages us to continue. When I go pheasant hunting, I take a double barrel shotgun, side by side. I've done that for well over a decade. I don't remember exactly how that happened, but for many years, I never shot that gun. My parents gave it to me for Christmas when I was about 20, so it's, it's about 45 years old. And uh, the reason I never took it, first of all, I didn't take it because I took it one time to go quail hunting with my dad and my uncle, and I couldn't hit the side of a barn. I mean, if you've been used to one barrel and you get two barrels, and it's just like there's... I, I couldn't shoot, so I just put it up. Well, over time, it became kind of a sentimental type deal. It's like this, it, it was a beautiful gun. Uh, it had good memories with it, and so I just kind of looked at it. And then one year, uh, I decided to practice with it, and I practiced with it, and I could actually, sh I could actually hit some stuff with it. So I decided I'm taking this gun with me when I go pheasant hunting. Two shots, that's all you get. You don't get five shots, you get two. You either, you, you either can or you can't, you know, so I took it. And I, and I still took good care of it. It's really, it was really a, a, a nice gun. But then a few years ago, uh, I was chasing a wounded pheasant. He could no longer fly, but he could still run like a jackrabbit. And in Kansas, there's no fences to speak of. You might run across a hot wire once in a while, but usually there's no fences so I'm, uh, you know, we love to have a race. So I'm the guy that gets cornered off here, and I'm chasing after this pheasant. And, and the other guy's, yeah, get him, Earl, get him, Earl. So I'm running as hard as I can, and I go through the, you know, not many ditches to speak of either, just a little gravel road. And I was running, and then I caught my toe on where the gravel was raised on the edge of the road where it graded it. And I, I didn't face plant, but I elbow planted right there in the road. And it, it, was, it was ugly. And after everybody quit laughing, they came to see if I was okay. Uh, but I, after that day, my skin grew back. Uh, that's wonderful. That shotgun has scratches all over the barrels and all over the stock. And uh, it's not worth monetarily uh, what it was before that little stunt but it still shoots because successful hunting is not about having the perfect beautiful gun it's about the guy doing the shooting and God building his kingdom is not about him having the perfect beautiful believers it's about those who are available Scars and all, who are willing to say, here am I, use me. And God never misses, no matter what he's using or who he's using. So my encouragement to you, twofold. You know somebody in your realm of relationships that's struggling in various ways? Encourage them. God's not done with them. And if you are that one who is struggling right now, know that God can and will use you. Get up and let him use you in the future. Let's stand for prayer.
God, we all are grateful today for your grace. Your grace that means that even when we fail, even when we stray, even when we go into the far country, that you are waiting for us and you can and will forgive when we repent. Whether that's the first time we need to be saved, we can repent. We can admit our sin, accept your grace, and uh, volunteer to follow after you, and you'll save us. And if uh, we've been saved for decades, and yet we've strayed, uh, all we have to do is admit our sin, accept your grace, and allow you to change our behavior. And so uh, we await you this morning. We're, We're before you. And thank you for your grace so that John Mark didn't get cast aside and forgotten. Uh, He ended up when it was very useful. And we can do the same by your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. If I can pray with you, help you in any way, I'll be here at the front as we sing our final song. My name is Amy Henderson. I am the pharmacy director and board member for the Agape Medical Clinic here in Weatherford. I wanted to send you this message to thank you for your generous support of our clinic and also to give you some information about the services that we offer here. Our clinic provides free clothing, medications, medical care, and vision care to those in our community and communities around Oklahoma. We are fortunate to be able to offer these services regardless of income level, insurance status, or location of the patient. We currently serve people from about 38 cities and 15 counties throughout Oklahoma. Even though 2020 was a tough year for all of us, the Agape Medical Clinic was still able to see about 200 patients last year, and we are hopeful that that continues to grow this year as we continue to be able to open up and go back to normal procedures. We are open two days of each month, the second and fourth Thursday, except for November and December where we're only open the second Thursday due to holidays. We start seeing patients about 5 p.m. and until the last patient is seen by our providers. If you would like more information about our clinic, 
Feel free to visit us on Facebook at Agape Medical Clinic or you can contact us at our voicemail line which is 580-414-3100 if you need any assistance. We do have a clothing bin outside of our clinic at 912 West Main where we take donated clothing items and our optometrist would be forever grateful if you have glasses frames that you're not using at home that we could repurpose for our patients here to provide them a brand new pair of glasses. As our name implies, we strive to meet the medical and basic needs for those in our community through service and unconditional love of our clinic volunteers and generous donors like FBC Weatherford. Your support helps our clinic staff to bless others with medical and vision care but we also provide spiritual support and opportunities for spiritual growth. We definitely couldn't do what we do without support, and we cannot thank you enough for choosing our mission to be supported by your uh, membership. So thank you, and may God bless you all. Uh, we're trying, we're not just trying, we are. Every third Sunday, we're giving you just a little bit of, who you support, who we support as a church, and let you know what's going on around here, not to ask for more money you're already giving. So thank you for your support of the Agape Clinic. And then also I have an announcement to make also. Uh, this coming weekend, a person is coming in view of a call as the First Baptist Church Associate Minister of Children and Families. Um, they've asked that we not release their name until this coming weekend. Uh, but and so we're not but they will be here uh, there'll be a meet and greet on Saturday at four to six o'clock in the afternoon uh, down here in the South Commons you can come by and meet uh, this person and their family and then they'll speak in the Sunday morning service and we'll vote uh, they won't do the whole sermon like I'm not giving that up uh, the uh, they'll share about a little bit uh, but that will be next Sunday morning, and then we'll vote on whether to call them as the Associate Minister of Children and Families. Thanks for being here. You're dismissed. Have a great time in Life Group.